so that clock is maybe slow, but Well, I guess we can go by that clock. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, very good. Um, so uh, let's see. Firstly, um, Gopi, you, want, you wanted to reschedule your office hours because I think it overlaps with another class that some of you are taking on that seminar in many body physics. Uh, so. Um, what time are you suggesting? Anytime before one. Yeah, so uh, does anyone have a time that doesn't work for them? Everyone has, some people have to find mechanics on Wednesday, right? Which goes until when? 12.15. Right, so we could do it after that, say. Uh, 12.15 to 115 or something like that, could always still have to go early. Yeah. Does the main body start at 1? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the other choice is do it in the morning before, uh, from 10 to 11. Okay. Uh, speak now or forever. Don't speak. <laughs> talking about a, a very basic but very important problem, the model of absorption and emission of light by matter by just thinking about the dynamics of a charge on a spring. Um, and that gets us pretty far. It's something really important to understand very deeply because we're going to draw on these concepts when we talk about the quantum mechanics as well. It's not divorce. Right? From this physics, all right. Um, so it's a very simple problem. We just have a charge on a spring, and that spring has a natural resonance frequency omega naught, and we assume that there's some damping constant uh, gamma, all right. So that the dynamics of the position of the electron relative to its equilibrium position is just a damped chromatic oscillator that is, has a force to it. And that force, in this case, was due to um, an electric field that is associated with an incident of magnetic wave that is incident on the atom. Okay? And so locally, at the position of the atom, there is some electric field that has some frequency oscillating, some frequency omega, and there's some uh, complex amplitude associated with that electric field. And so what that will do, as we described last time, will, it will induce an electric dipole moment. Okay? And that electric dipole moment, uh, when we solve this equation, what we found is that the electric dipole moment is linearly proportional to the electric field. Okay? And that proportionality constant in the complex amplitude is the atomic polarizability. And it has this form we found last time approximately when the detuning is small compared to the rest of the frequency. Yeah? In the equation for the dipole moment, what happened to the little e, like the electron charge? That, that is the electron charge. On the next line, it goes into the alpha? It goes into the alpha, indeed. It goes into the alpha, C has an E squared in it. So alpha is the whatever it is proportion to electric field. So it has all the constants in it. All right? And it has this form. And what that means, when we go back, take the real part that the real part of this tells us how much of the dipole is oscillating in phase with the applied electric field. And this is the proportionality constant. And how much is in quadrature. 
And this is the proportionality concept here, okay? And the, uh, this response has this very familiar form of a, uh, the imaginary part is a Lorentzian with a full width half maximum given by gamma. And the real part has this dispersion line shape. Okay, so as we discussed, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we say that the real part of alpha is, is associated with the dispersive response of the medium. It's the part that gives rise to the index of refraction, the phase shift induced on the field, which gives a phase delay as the index of refraction. And the imaginary part is the dissipative response. It's related to the I, the fact that energy will be absorbed by matter, okay, and the amount of absorption depends on gamma, and of course the two, okay, and we talked about the physics of that and how that worked last time, and the physical sources of this damping, well, it really depends on the material itself. If we're talking about a gas, um, then the sources of damping of the oscillator could be collisions with other molecules that make up the gas. Uh, if we're talking about a solid, it might be due to lattice vibrations, phonons in the system. There are many sources that can give rise to that friction, that thing that gives rise to damping of energy. But there is a fundamental source. We got rid of all of these. It's what we call the natural line with, and that's due to the fact that the uh, charge radiates. Not only does it absorb energy, but it emits energy. You study that in this lovely assignment that you just handed in. Uh, couldn't be more lovely. Um, and uh, that radiation gives rise to a, a fundamental source of damping, radiation damping. And we're going to talk about that in the quantum context soon. Yes, sir. Um, what is the role of phonons and collisions? So the natural line width and the radiation got incorporated by gamma. So I was wondering what, how did they? Uh, well, I'm saying all of the collisions, there, there are different physical sources that will all give rise to gamma, OK? Um, collisions are one possible source. So in a gas like in the fluorescent light bulb, that's a definite source of damping uh, If I had a molecule that vibrated, I can also think about well, those vibrations, they can also give rise if there's some coupling between, you know, different modes of the molecule, those ones, they can give rise to damping as well, or in a solid. Uh, and of course, at the very base, even if we got rid of all of those, even at absolute zero, there would still be a fundamental natural line width, and that is due to radiation. All right, very good. All right, good. So, um, so now let's think about this from the point of view of quantum mechanics. And finally, finally, this quantum optics. So let's say something about that. Um, so, well, we know from our studies of quantum mechanics that one way to think about uh, the problem of absorption emission of electromagnetic fields by matter, say atoms, so let's talk about the quantum description of absorption emission of magnetic fields by This course will mostly be restricting our attention to an atoms because they're the simplest things to talk about. 
Um, so we know one the way we would talk about this is well, we would say there's some interaction Hamiltonian that describes the interaction of the fuel with the atom. And typically what we would look at is a situation where um, the wavelength of the electromagnetic waves that we're considering when we go to work is big compared to the fundamental size of the atom, say. In which case we can make a multiple expansion. So we would write this interaction Hamiltonian in terms of the multipoles, the electric dipole moment, the electric quadrupole moment, the electric octopole moment, magnetic dipole moment, et cetera, et cetera, interacting with fields. So we would say there's some electric dipole operator interacting with the electric field at the position of the atom. That's the center of mass position of the atom. And then there would be a term that would be related to the magnetic dipole moment interacting with whatever magnetic field is. And then we might have a term that looks like, you know, the electric quadrupole type interaction. This is, of course, for a neutral atom. And of course, at the lowest order, there's a uh, times the potential. The electrostatic potential. And that's the that's the uh, the term that has to do with the total charge. If it was say an ion, but the moment we're just going to talk about neutral particles, so we just care about that. It's not total charge. So the lowest order interaction be the dipole interactions. And as so. This is a multifold expansion. And under the assumption that the wavelength of the wave is huge compared to sort of the typical size of the atom. And this would be true, for example, you know, if we're not talking about X-rays or gamma rays, this is angstrom size. This is a good approximation, right? Um, and the low, but this term dominates. So, and under this approximation, this is the dominant term. So, when we talk about interaction of atom and light, we, unless for some reason, the effect of this term is zero because say there are dipole selection rules that we know about, and those make a certain transition forbidden. Unless that's true, this would be what we would write down as the interaction of the light and the atoms, dipole interaction. All right? So um, let's see. Right. So, now, this electric field, let's say, is of the form we just wrote down. It's you know the real part of some complex amplitude, even the minus sign negative. Let's look at the case where we're driving our atom with a electromagnetic wave that has a certain frequency. For the moment, we'll just take it to be monochromatic, one frequency. Make that more general, but let's just look at the simplest case to start, right? And of course, that's equal to one half of that complex number plus the complex time scale. Okay. So what we see here in this case is that our Hamilton interaction Hamiltonian has a familiar form. It has a part that's proportional to either the minus i omega t. We call that, for perverse reasons in physics, the positive frequency component. And a part that 
that is, so it's like u to the plus i to make it to Okay? This is, of course, just equal to this dotted into electric vacuum moment, and the negative frequency component is this dotted into minus the electric vacuum moment. All right? Okay, so this is our Hamiltonian. Now, what happens? Well, you remember if we wanted to look at the dynamics that would be related to absorption or emission of this electromagnetic field by the atom, what we have to solve for the time evolution of the wave function or the state vector associated with being driven according to Schrodinger's equation with this Hamiltonian, right? And, but we can solve that approximately based on time-dependent perturbation theory, which we have all studied. So from time-dependent perturbation theory, what we know is that um, if I wanted to calculate the lowest non-vanishing order in the inter-interaction Hamiltonian, the transition probability, so suppose I have some initial state of the atom, might be the ground state or whatever, it doesn't matter, might be an excited state, there's some initial state of the atom, let's call it I and some final state, F, all right? And I want to know what is the probability that I, after some time T, I start in the initial state and then I end up in the final state. And we usually write it that way for reasons that have to do with matrix elements that you remember in a moment. So that, anybody remember what that probability is? Unit carry evolution on the original state. Is that right. right. So we could. Go, that's right. I mean, that would generally be the case. I mean, that would, this is equal to, as you say, and we might do it in the interaction fiction. So we would say this is the interaction Hamiltonian in the, you know, it's the time evolution operator. But it doesn't really matter. We just do that. We express this. You go to the time. But then there's some, you do perturbation theory. I want the lowest known order in perturbation theory. This is not the perturbation result. This is the exact result. This is what Schrodinger equation tells us, right? But then there's a way to expand this and do all that when we get first order. And I'm looking at you people who were in my class <laughs> last spring. Did we just say the of the Hamiltonian? Yeah, it depends on the matrix elements, right? So it depends something on the matrix element from the initial state to the final state. Now you remember that there's two terms here. One term having to do with e to the minus i omega t, and one term that you go to looks like e to the plus i omega t. So there's a, a term here that depends on that matrix element squared. The positive, but with the i's and the s on the other side. Right, and you remember, of course, it depends on these energy denominators. Remember those? Now, you guys don't have any excuse. I'm going to be 50 soon, and my memory is allowed to go, but yours isn't yet. So this is the non-degenerator. So we have. Let's call this omega sub L for laser, or light. And then it depends on right, there's this sync function. Remember that sync function? And then there is the other term. Okay, 
Okay, so that's the uh, expression you get from time-dependent perturbation theory. And what we see, importantly, is that there is resonance So when this term, I mean, this is a function that I, is the sink function. Uh, this should be times t, excuse me. Um, which is, has a resonant structure such that when the denominator is zero, this is one, right? And then it falls off. So the dominant terms are, there are two possibilities. When h bar omega, this is resonant when h bar omega is equal or omega equals that. That term dominates. And this term dominates when omega L equals omega initial minus omega final change. Okay? So, where omega L is a positive number. So, this term is related to absorption. That is to say, when the final energy is bigger than the initial energy by exactly the amount h bar omega of the Planck laser. So when the laser frequency matches the Bohr frequency, the Bohr frequency is the energy difference divided by h bar, then I get absorption. And this is the opposite case when the initial energy is bigger than the final energy, in which case I have resonance. And that resonance then is associated with low, going to a lower final energy state, that is emission. That's what I stimulate emission. Okay? Um, but one of the takeaway messages here is that the dominant, if there is no energy difference here, if the energy difference is extremely far from uh, the applied frequency. Well, then absorption or emission is tiny. Okay, so it's resonance. So if I have a situation where I detune, my detuning is not very big from resonance. I tune close to resonance. Then only the states for which the energy difference, the only eigenstates of the atom for that contribute in any substantial way to this are the ones that are close enough to that frequency, okay? So what that tells us then, and this is a very important fact, that when I'm tuned close to resonance, I can restrict the dynamics that describe the Schrodinger evolution of the system to two energy levels, okay? So if I have two energy levels and my uh, laser is detuned by an amount that's tiny compared to this, and every other level that could possibly be connected by this field is very far away from this, then I only need to restrict myself to these discrete energy states. For example, let's call this one E, the excited state, and this one G. Yes, sir? Uh, uh, so for this probability, though, have you already kind of, maybe I'm not understanding, but like, because you're only looking at the matrix center between two different I's and F's, have you already discarded the possibilities that they go to other states? That could be, this is what I'm saying is, this is an arbitrary uh -huh. F. I don't know what this initial, so I'm taking any two I want. Okay. Right. And I'm saying that 
Uh, so let's say, let me draw a picture over here. So let's say, you know, this is my level. So this is say level one, level two, level three. Okay, and let's suppose I tune very close to two, and the detuning to three is, you know, so let's say this is a few megahertz, and this is some, you know, so many terahertz away, billion times bigger. If I looked at the transition probability from here to here, it's huge, and, the, the, and if I went one to three, it would be essentially zero. So this is just saying if I plugged in one to three here, this would be zero, essentially. It would be tiny. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, mean, I was I was just thinking like so the total problem, I mean, so you know there's already some approximations in this though? Because I was thinking like sure. if three was closer. It was, yeah. You know, for this P to F to yeah. I to F. Like yeah. so if uh, I was one and F was two. But if three was closer to two, then the probability of going to three would be like subtracted away from this probability of going to no, two. No, not the out. first order. Not the first I mean, so not the first order. You know, you're, you're absolutely right. I've done first order perturbation theory. Okay. If I wanted to find the total probability, it would be all of these. And if it were the case that there was another level that was extremely close to this, that was also dipole allowed, then this would this two-level approximation would be a bad approximation. Because in that case, it's not just these two levels for which I could absorb. It's this, this, and three, if three were very close. And as you know, sometimes I have degeneracy, right? And they're right next to one another. But I could still make a two-level approximation depending on the polarization. Because this might be a pi transition, and this is sigma transition. So it depends not just on the energy, but also the matrix element. Very good. All right, so, yeah, the deck. Um, in the same figure, um, yeah. if the um, frequency was such that you could go from one to three and two was very close, mm -hmm. but still far away from your actual transition frequency that you were uh, putting in, then would the same situation hold? So if they were both very close, but I was detuned far from both of them, is uh, that what you mean? Um, no, so, so in, the, in your last diagram. So this is one, and you two, have two. Yeah. And you are, your omega, your arrow yeah. goes from one to three and is very close to three. So it's one, then it would be a one, then this would be my two level transition. But that would still work even though two is lower, right? Then I would ignore two, it doesn't matter where two is. Okay. I mean, the point is that the transition to two is negligible. So what I'm calling my two levels are the two levels that are near resonantly connected by my laser field. Any other levels, whether they're above, below. below, right next to, as long as they're not connected near resonant by my applied fields, they have negligible participation in dynamics. And even though my atom is described by an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, in principle, in practice, excellent, super duper, couldn't be better approximation is forget every other of those infinite levels in my Hilbert space and just restrict your attention to two. Okay? And that's what we call a two level atom. Yeah. So then are we going to ignore spontaneous decay for this? For the moment, we're not talking about that. Yeah. We haven't, we, we have, because of course, to really talk about that, we need to talk about the quantum field, because it is the quantum nature of the field that is, in some sense, responsible for spontaneous emission. But at the moment, we're not including that. We'll get back to that soon. All right, so this is what we call a two-level atom. Quantum mechanics and quantum optics is all about two level atoms and harmonic oscillator, and maybe three if you like. Um, all right, so uh, what that says then is that I can restrict 
the description to um, a two-dimensional Hilbert space. And that Hilbert space is spanned by any two orthogonal vectors in this space, or spanned by the, so it's a span of the two basis vectors G and E. Okay? So that's my two dimensional Hilbert space. And in that case, the interaction Hamiltonian was d dot d. And I can insert in here a resolution of the identity, as we love to do. And the identity is spanned by uh, the states g any that is a resolution of the identity, right? In this Hilbert space. So this means that this is equal to minus G G G G G, G plus D D D E plus G, G, D, plus D, 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 G, G. That is to be like the Okay? So that's the interaction Hamiltonian restricted to the subspace spanned by these two atomic levels, okay? Now, we know some things, though, about these matrix elements based on the physics, right? So the dipole, you remember, is the position of the electron relative to the nucleus, dot times the charge of the electron. That's the electric dipole operator. This is a operator that is odd under reflection. So this is parity odd. If I take r to minus r, this changes sign, flips sign, right? However, the eigenstates of the atom, like an S show, or a P, orbital are eigenstates of parity, either even or odd parity. And therefore, since they are eigenstates of parity, you cannot have a matrix element of an odd parity operator with an eigenstate of parity. I mean, you kind of see that immediately here because there's equal amount of charge here than here. And the same thing is true here when you square this, which is what happens here. You square that, it's an even function integrated with an odd function, which is zero. So there's a parity selection rule that tells us that the eigenstates of the atom don't have a dipole moment. The only thing that has a dipole moment is some superposition of this and this where the electron would be, say, if this would add the wave function constructively here, take away here, and I get you know, some banana of electron charge relative to the nucleus, the proton over here, and that has a dipole. That's a superposition of those two. So dipoles are induced in the atom due to a superposition a quantum superposition 
of ground in excited states. That's how you induce that moment. You have to make a superposition. Otherwise, you don't have a that moment. All right? OK, now, we'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, let's, what was I do? OK, so, um, what, one of the lessons to take away from what we've done so far is that when we have this near resonance excitation, we have this two-dimensional Hilbert space, we can describe all the dynamics in this way. So what we want to talk about is we want to talk about the general properties of 2D Hilbert spaces, which are very important. Something we've done before, we'll review today. So what, what we said here is that in this near residence approximation, we can restrict our attention to two levels. And when we have the two levels, we have a 2D Hilbert space. But what is true is that all 2D Hilbert spaces are isomorphic. Mathematically, they're the same. And there are different physical systems that are described by 2D Hilbert spaces. We just talked about one, but there are many. The generic case, what we would call the quintessential, or maybe I call it the canonical case. Everyone knows the word canonical in physics. Is spin one half. So if I have a spin one half particle, my two D Hilbert space are spanned by two orthogonal spades spin up and spin down. That's a two D Hilbert space. But there are other cases. I might think about the polarization state of a photon. That's described by a 2D over space. Because if you think about it, you can have, if your, pro if your photon is propagating with some weight vector, k, then I can talk about its polarization state being in the plane, or more generally, in a complex plane. I could have a particular basis might be, say, horizontal and vertically polarized photons, right? H and V. Or I can think about right and left circularly polarized photons there and a good a basis as well for polarization states. Or the example we're talking about now, the two-level atom. Where we're spanned by these two states, G and E. <laughs> All of these Hilbert spaces are mathematically the same, even though they describe completely different physics. And so we want, one of the things that we do is that in talking about all of these problems, we in some sense connect them to our understanding of the physics of spin one half particles. And we talk about the two level atom as a kind of pseudo-spin. So I might have a pseudo-spin where I might say the ground state 
is spin down, and the excited state is spin up. This is a mapping. It has nothing to do with the spin of the electron here. Nothing. It's just a mapping. I'm just saying, let me call the ground state. It's as if it were a spin one half particle, where this state I call spin down, and this state I call spin up. And think about the two level atom like a spin, even though this has nothing to do with the spin of the electron. In modern parlance, we call these, these two-level systems quantum bits, or qubits. And it's, I think, maybe last year was the uh, 20th anniversary of the invention of the word qubit, um, um, where we think about this now as a, a kind of quantum bit where, say, up is logical zero and down is logical one, like a bit. But of course, what makes this a quantum bit is that I can have a quantum superposition of zero and one. And that's where all the fun happens. All right, so what we want to talk about then for the remainder of the lecture is to remind ourselves of some of the mathematical properties associated with 2D Hilbert spaces, which is all based on what we know about spin one half. Okay? So we use the language of spin one half to describe any 2D Hilbert space, even if that 2D Hilbert space has nothing to do with spin whatsoever. It's a pseudo spin. All right? So let's remind ourselves. So if we're talking about spin one half, well, I have spin angular momentum. S. Right? Um, and the spin angular momentum operator, its components satisfy the usual commutation relations associated with the components of any angular momentum, right? <coughs> and in this case, of course, they commute with the magnitude squared and the mag and the uh, we can have a basis here S, M sub S, where S squared on this is H bar squared S, S plus 1, and SZ, the eigenstate of SZ in the standard basis. Right? The standard. Angular momentum algebra. And of course, for spin one half, S is a half. Right? And M sub S goes from minus S to S in integer units, which means that M sub S can be minus a half or plus a half. Hence, we have spin up is the state a half a half and spin down is the state a half minus a half. Right. Now of course when we're dealing with spinning momentum for spin one half, it's convenient to get rid of the h bar and the half and define the Pauli operators. Oh, I guess before I do that, I should just remind ourselves that about raising and lowering the operators. So if I write um, S plus or minus as Sx plus or minus I Sy, 
that S plus or minus acting on one of the eigenstates of the latter operators that are S, S plus 1, minus N, N plus or minus 1, S plus or minus 1. That's the usual ladder operators for, for angular momentum, and in the particular case for spin 1 half, this comes out nice, which this is just if I raise spin down, I get to spin up. And if I raise, if I lower spin up, I get to spin down. That square root factor is one in that case. Plus. find the Pauli algebra by getting rid of the h bar over 2 to find s as h bar over 2 sigma. Okay? We define, as I said, the spin up state and spin down state are, are there. Um, so let's see. Sigma z. So this is the, you know, so there's a sigma x, a sigma y, and a sigma z. Right. Sigma z, we remember, of course, these are eigenstates. Spin up and spin down are eigenstates. These, when I write spin up without any label, by definition, it's the spin up along the z-axis. That's just the convention. And its eigenvalue here gets rid of that h bar over 2. And so that's just equal to. And this guy would be minus h bar over 2 gets rid of that. So this is equal to minus. In this language, if I call this state 0, this the z eigenvalue, then another way of writing this, where z can be 0 or 1, is this is minus 1 to the z. Another way of writing it. Where z is 0 or 1, depending on whether it's up or down. This is another way of writing it. All right. So that means, so these are eigenvectors, so that means that sigma z is diagonal in that basis, written as a matrix. In this basis, it has eigenvalues 0, 1. So this is the matrix representation. in the standard basis. And the standard basis is the basis of spin up and down along the z-axis. Um, what about these guys? Well, one thing that, just to keep in mind, there are these silly factors of two and how they go. It's one of the unfortunate facts of life, but it is, that one defines sigma plus to be equal to s plus, after we go to h bar for constant 2. We just define it that way. The reason being is that this had such a nice property that s plus acting on the state, you know, got rid of, just turned spin up to spin down, it has the effect that Sigma plus takes spin down to spin up, and sigma minus 
takes spin up to spin down. Okay, with no factors. That's just how it is. By the way, what happens when sigma plus acts on spin up? In my Same thing. This is, it's the null factor. Now, according to this, what we have then is that sigma x is equal to um, Sx divided by a4 over 2, right, by definition. Now, Sx is related to S plus and S minus. So this then is equal to sigma plus plus I sigma minus, no, sigma x plus sigma minus over 2. Uh, excuse me. No, the two goes away just like that. And sigma minus, or sigma y, is sy over a4 over 2 is equal to sigma plus minus sigma minus over i. Or minus i sigma plus. Sigma x and sigma y and sigma z are known as the Pauli matrices. All right. Now, familiarizing yourself, becoming comfortable, using the Pauli algebra is extremely important for what we're going to do in this course. So, yeah, if you haven't studied it before, see me. If you have, review it. We're going to do it very rapidly now. Um, so what are some of the pro more properties of the Pauli operators? Well, what we know, first of all, the Pauli operators for any two components, x, y, or z, well, these were related to uh, the um, the spin components, so this is factor of 2, i, epsilon, i, j, k, sigma k, as we had before, right? 
If I divide everything by 4, this becomes, or we have an h bar right there, that becomes s sub k and then s sub i and s sub j, what we had previously. What's also true is that the uh, anti commutator between any two of these guys, which is to say, you reverse the order, but you put a plus sign between them. Then that's zero uh, unless i equals j. And when i equals j, it's equal to twice the identity. So this is two delta i. So what are some other properties that follow from this? Well, one thing we can say then is the following. If I look at any one of the Pauli matrices, x, y, or z, and I look at its value squared, so that's, let's just say I put i equals j here. Then this would be sigma i squared, sigma i squared, 2 sigma i squared is equal to twice the i. So this is equal to this thing squared to the identity. Okay. And you can kind of see that. At least one of these guys, you can quickly see. If you multiply this by itself, you get 1. Same thing is true for this and this. Um, what else can we say about the power matrices? Um, well, they're Hermitian. Any one of them, if you take its dagger, you will step well, that had to have been true because they were proportional to the components of angular momentum. And the components of angular momentum are observables, which are emission operators. So it's not a surprise that they're emission. But what that also says, that's something interesting about the tallies, is that they're also, therefore, unitary. Because if I multiply one of these guys by its conjugate, well, since it's permission, that's the same thing as that, so it's that square, but that's one. So that says that the um, eigenvalue, as it says that this is unitary. Okay. Now, a unitary matrix has a special kind of eigenvalues, right? What are the eigenvalues of a unitary matrix? Phase. They're phases. The eigenvalues of a unitary matrix are, are, so the eigenvalues lambda sub alpha, say, whatever they are, there's something that have their unimodular complex numbers. That's to say that they're generally phases. Right? However, what are the um, eigenvalues of a, her of a Hermitian operator? They're real. What are the only real numbers that have magnitude 1? Plus or minus 1. So that tells me that the eigenvalues of the Pauli operators are plus and minus 1. Well, we kind of knew that. We knew that because this guy, we see that, and sigma x and sigma y are similar matrices to sigma z. Thus, if this had eigenvalues plus or minus 1, those do. Yeah? From that logic, couldn't they have had either both eigenvalues be 1 or both eigenvalues be negative 1? They can. That's true. But that, like, they, so we don't know that they're plus, that they're plus and minus 1. The only thing we know is that in this case is what sigma z is. So you're right. We couldn't have said. They could have both been minus 1 or both plus 1. 
But from the argument, this other argument we see that. But it's not surprising that they're plus or minus. Okay, so the eigenvalues of all of them are plus or minus. Um, I can furthermore talk about let me call sigma sub n this. Okay? So what I mean by that is en dotted into dx sigma x plus en dot dy sigma y plus en sigma z here. Okay. So this is the Pauli operator along some arbitrary direction where this is a, a unit vector in 3D. Okay. What are the eigenvalues of this operator? Plus or minus 1. It has to be for the reasons we just described. Okay. So it's true that this is this thing is permission. This thing squares to 1, and its eigenvalues are plus or minus 1. Come back to its eigenvectors in a moment. All right. Um, what else can we say about the capital matrices? Well, um, The set sigma zero, or let me call it the identity, sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z, which are sometimes called sigma zero, sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three. Here, this is another notation for the same thing. Span the set of two by two matrices. That's to say, any two by two matrix can be written as some amount of identity, some amount of sigma x, some amount of sigma y, some amount of sigma z. That follows because they're just they're linearly independent matrices and the set of two die two matrices forms a vector space of dimension four because it's two by two. So the two by two matrices is a four dimensional vector space. Moreover, they don't just span them, they are orthogonal. Matrices. So they're, they're orthogonal matrices in the following sense. We can define the dot product, the inner product, between two matrices in the following way. I take the two matrices, I multiply them together by conjugating one of them, and then I take the trace. The trace, remember, is the sum of the diagonal elements. Now, why does this make sense that this is like a dot product or an inner product that you know 
from, say, point that you take to a Braun and Ket. This is an inner product. This is like a top product. Vectorize the matrices is literally just taking the inner product. Exactly. So let's just say what, what Keith is saying, let's say A is equal to A11, A12, A21, A22 in some basis. Vectorizing that means make it a, a vector in as a column matrix. Okay. And do the same thing with B. Then this operation is the same thing as you would do taking the dot product of those two vectors. It's the Euclidean product. All right, so if that's what it means for two operators or matrices to be orthogonal, I claim the Pauli matrices and identity are all orthogonal to one another. That's to say, the trace, of course, there are permissions, so I don't have to take is equal to delta ij times 2. How do I see that? From the, <coughs> from the relationship that you had, where, like, if you square it, you get, if you square two of them, yeah, I'm going to do the same. You just get, you know, the identity. So that's just two. We take a trace, but when you multiply one by another, you just uh, you just get another sigma matrix. Which exactly. Is exactly. Exactly. So, so let me repeat that. <laughs> but that's exactly correct. So I can put these two expressions together. So this says epsilon sigma i. Sigma J plus minus sigma J sigma I is equal to this. But if I add this to this, what I see is that the product of two Pauli matrices is equal to I epsilon I J K sigma K plus delta I J times the identity. Two by the delta? Uh, no, I divide by two, right? I add this to this and then divide by two. Right? So now I take that says if you multiply two Pauli matrices that are different, you get another Pauli matrix with a plus or minus i out in front, depending on the order. If you multiply two Pauli matrices with the charge of the same, you get the identity. Now take the trace of this. Well, that's the trace of this and the trace of this. And we just said that the trace is equal to the sum of the diagonal elements. The trace of these diagonal elements, you can always write it in its eigenbasis, is plus 1 plus minus 1. So the tr they're traceless matrices, all the power matrices are traceless. And the trace of identity in 2D is 1 plus 1, which is 2. So that's where this comes from. All right. With that said, we have the following very important result. says that if I have a two-dimensional matrix or an operator on a 2D Hilbert space, first of all, this is a basis, which means that I can expand this in the description. And I claim the following is true, that this is equal to a0 identity plus a half a not into sigma, where A0 is the trace of A with the identity, or is the trace of A, 
and the vector a is the trace uh, with the power matrices. How do I see that? Well, what we just said, I mean, this is what this thing, just writing, writing this out a little bit more, one half, a zero, sigma zero, plus a one, sigma one, plus a two, sigma two, plus a three, sigma three, right? These are like basis vectors for matrices. And to get the components along the base vector, I look at the dot product. So if I look at the trace of A with sigma 0, well, that's going to give me the trace of that square root of 2. It's going to give me A0 plus the trace of sigma 0 with sigma 1, which is 0, because it's orthogonal to an entity. This is orthogonal, I just pick off that term, etc. So this is an important relation. It says that any operator in 2D to Hilbert space dimensions can be written as some amount of identity and some amount of the Pauli matrices. And the amount depends on the projection of that onto that particular Pauli matrix. And the projection is just the trace. So I'm projecting it, a certain component Yes, yeah, so uh, so the, you know, the a vector equals trace of a times the sigma vector. Yeah. So I would take like a times sigma x, and, and I would get this take that trace, and right. then that would be the x component. Correct. Okay. Okay. So I can write this out more nicely: sigma x, just to make it more clear. Right. So a x, I would take whatever that matrix was and I project it onto sigma x by taking the trace. Okay. And that gives me the component of sigma x. It's a projection onto that direction in matrix space. Yes? Um, so you use the word projection, which we generally reserve for, or we use when we say dot product. Yep. The only confusion is that in the dot product, there was an adjoint. Well, which is, of course, we remember that this is a dot product on a complex space. So for example, you know about this kind of thing. This is a dot product in Hilbert space. This is a space of vectors. And this is like, if this was an infinite dimensional space, psi star, right? So it's the conjugate. When you have a complex vector space, to respect the norm, you have to conjugate. But we don't have to conjugate here, even though we think it. this has a projection. Oh because I really want, that's what I'm really doing. I'm projecting onto this vector, but this vector is Hermitian. Okay. Good, good catch, indeed. It's a subtle point. That's why I do have to conjugate it. Yes. All right. Um, so let me just, we're going to pick this up next time, but I want to just, we have three minutes according to that, and so I'm going to use that as my actual clock. <laughs> and just remind you, there's one last thing that we didn't really get to, but I want to get to now, because it's truly important. And that is, what about, so, in 2D space, Any unitary matrix on that, well, it's always the case that this is e to the i times some Hermitian matrix. Okay? 
So we put in this case a use permission. So any unitary operator always can be written that way, right? Now, we just said if it's a 2D, this is not just about 2D over in any open space. This is always true. But in a in, in a particular case, this is a 2D Hilbert space, we just said this. Right? I'm sorry. Let's see. But we just said it. So let's plug that in. So that means, so this is a unitary, this is the group U2. That is to say, it's the group of unitary matrices in two dimensions. And those, those matrices or operators have the form e to the some phase, the identity doesn't matter, times e to the i a dot sigma over 2. All right? Let me multiply top and bottom by h bar. <clears throat> well, then this is of the form e to the i sum phase, where this phase is that, times e to the i a dotted into the spin and momentum vector over h bar. Right? Because h bar over 2 times sigma is the spin vector. Do you recognize this operator? It's a rotation. It's a rotation operator. This is a rotation in physical space. In other words, if I write this as some number, which I'll call theta, times some vector, so theta here is the magnitude of A, and E sub N is the direction of the vector, then this operator has the form E to the I, or minus I, let me put minus this. Theta and dot. And what does that operator do? What it does is it rotates a vector about the axis of rotation defined by n by an amount theta. So physically, if I have, so here's my axis of rotation, and I have some vector, then I rotate around that, oh, that's a terrible picture, by some angle theta. Well, actually, by the right angle, not the left angle. So it rotates around this axis by an angle. So one of the takeaway messages here, and we'll pick this up next time, is that any, any unitary operator in 2D Hilbert space is up to an overall global phase, which we can care less about because in quantum mechanics, the overall global phase is irrelevant is equivalent to a rotation. A rotation of a vector in physical space. This gets really confusing. Because there's so many spaces we're talking about. We have Hilbert space, we have matrix space, and then we have the space we're in, 3D, right? When I'm talking about a rotation, I'm not talking about a rotation. I mean, so it's kind of confusing. We're going to go back and forth, and we're going to see these different pictures that this is, in some sense, a rotation of a vector in Hilbert space, but its action is related to rotation of a physical vector in physical space. Okay, we're going to have to keep.
keep all that straight. Think about it. Anyway, we'll pick this up. We'll talk about it a little bit in the problem session tomorrow, 10.15, and we'll continue from there. Do I have any procedure homework?